Onto your headphones and pour your favorite beverage. It's time for the Kicking or Sticking Fantasy Football Podcast. Now, fresh off the sidelines, your host, Matt McPeak. Fantasy freaks and geeks, what's up? Welcome to the Kickin' or Stickin' Fantasy Football Podcast, where we try to make your fantasy decisions just a little bit easier. Thanks for tuning in. This is the XFL Week 4 preview. Uh, Week 3 had its ups and downs. The Sunday games were both kind of blowouts, but uh, we saw the return of professional football to St. Louis. It was awesome. I thought the Seattle crowd was going to be the best uh, home field advantage in this league, but I think the St. Louis crowd was just as loud, if not louder, in that dome. Um, Battlehawks played great. Uh, Los Angeles got its first win with an offensive explosion. They scored six touchdowns. Uh, We had our first revenge game of the year. Uh, It was actually kind of a double revenge game with Trey McBride and Rashad Ross. We saw another three-touchdown game by Cam Phillips. He's lighting this league up right now. Uh, First kickoff return touchdown in the XFL with a uh, a little lateral involved. It was cool. And the Vipers, they finally scored their first offensive touchdown. So congratulations to them. All in all, it was a good week three. Hopefully week four uh, is as much fun. I'm very excited for this Houston-Dallas game. I think we could be uh, could be in line for our first XFL shootout between these two Texas teams. Um, so real quick, we'll run through uh, the, or, you know, the order of things here in this episode. We're going to start by looking back at the uh, betting results of week three, see who covered what happened with the over-unders. Uh, then we'll jump into the four games. I'll drop my three-team parlay for week four, although I've missed on both uh, my week two and three parlays so far for the XFL. Feeling good about this one. Uh, and then I'll give you my FanDuel lineup for week four, some guys that I think are are ready to, to do work. So um, looking back at week three, so of the three home dogs in week three, Los Angeles was the only upset. Uh, again, they... they scored six touchdowns in that game they were they were on fire um they were getting eight points and they won by 30 over the dc defenders traveling out west um this was one of two games to go over with the total hitting 48 points uh much to the the dismay of my week three parlay um the other over to hit was houston at tampa bay this is the third week in a row that houston's game has went over um, I think the over is now, let's see, one, two, so it's four and uh, 13, I think. Uh, still a lot of these games are going under. Uh, anyway, Houston-Tampa Bay had the highest over-under of the week at 45 and a half, and the game ended at 61, so uh, they even put up more than that. Houston was laying six and a half to the home team Vipers, but they were able to cover. They won by seven points. Um, And the third home dog of the week uh, was Seattle hosting Dallas, um, Dallas minus five. Uh, Dallas still covered. uh, They won by 12, and the game stayed under 43 and a half. The total ended up at 36. Um, And then last but not least, the biggest spread of the week, uh, New York at St. Louis in the home opener for the Battle Hawks. Uh, The Guardians were getting 10 points, and that was nowhere near enough. Uh, The Battlehawks won by 20, um, and they kept it under 40 and a half. Uh, I was going to take that under, and I decided to go with the uh, LADC instead, which was a big mistake. Um, So again, uh, it's two overs, two unders. um, One of three home dogs actually won. The other two, um, the points were not enough, so... Uh, Something to keep in mind, Uh, I think after week one and two, all home teams won, and now after week three, um, only one, or no, two home teams won. So it seems like there really is a a home field advantage in this league, uh, especially at this battle dome and up there in Seattle. Um, 
Interesting stuff. So let's get into these games. Last week I kind of had to rush through at the end. I spent way too much time on the the intro and going through some of the stats that we saw after week two. But we're going to jump right into these games here. So Saturday at 2 o'clock is our first game. Uh, the L.A. Wildcats coming off of that big win against D.C. Uh, they are at the New York Guardians who are coming off of that big loss against St. Louis. Uh, both teams are 1-2 and two right now. Los Angeles is laying seven points to the home underdog New York Guardians. Um, I think this game is going to stay under 40. Uh, the Guardians defense really isn't all that bad. The L.A. defense has gotten better each week. Um, I think the uh, the better offense is the offense that's traveling across going West Coast to the East Coast for the early game. Um, so I, I think I might go with the under on this game. Uh, Josh Johnson average depth of target right now is at 12.9 yards. That's the highest in the XFL. Uh, although he's only started two weeks now, he is bombing the ball downfield. He's got, uh, he's got two good wide receivers. Um, LA scored more in week three than they did in weeks one and two combined. Uh, we saw Montez Carter really have a breakout game with Elijah hood. Now I'm not sure if he was out or if he just, uh, just didn't play, um, but Montez Carter took advantage of his opportunity for sure. He had those three touchdowns. He also caught a two-point conversion. Um, looking at the uh, the scoring chart here, so Josh Johnson, both of his touchdowns to Trey McBride were on bombs. Uh, 40-yard touchdown in the first quarter, um, a 28-yard touchdown in the second quarter. Both of those touchdowns were followed by a two-point attempt in which they targeted Nelson Spruce. Uh, both of them were unsuccessful. One of them uh, a corner route to the end zone, and and Josh Johnson just completely overthrew him. Um, and then Larry Rose and Montez Carter were were both uh, uh, playing well. They were running the ball. They were catching the ball. Uh, Rose had a touchdown. Montez had two. Tu- he actually had three touchdowns. Two of them rushing, one receiving. Um, and he also had a two point conversion um, where he uh, he caught a little swing pass. Uh, he he played great, man. I think uh, I think L.A. has no option but to continue uh, giving him the ball. Um, Elijah Hood, he had like an ankle issue, I think, coming into this week, and he had some fumble issues after the first two weeks. Uh, so if this performance by Montez Carter doesn't show the coaching staff that he deserves to get some touches, I don't know what will. Um, with a healthy Josh Johnson now and another legit threat at wide receiver opposite Nelson Spruce, that being Trey McBride, uh, we saw this L.A. offense really take off. Um, McBride wasn't able to play in week one or two, and uh, I really think uh, this this duo of receivers is going to do big things if uh, Josh Johnson can stay healthy and if they continue to push the ball down the field like they have been. Um, Trey McBride got some sweet old... Revenge. Yeah, he had some revenge uh, after... Um, DC traded him away, uh, started the season with the defenders. Um, LA traded Rashad Ross for Trey McBride. Everyone was saying, oh, DC got the better end of the trade. Uh, you know, everyone was saying Rashad Ross was the better player, but, um, Trey McBride had the way better game here in week three, five catches on six targets for 102 yards. And those two touchdowns that I mentioned, um, Nelson Spruce did have his worst game so far this year, but he was still able to catch three of his four targets for 75 yards. So um, I don't think this emergence of Trey McBride is really going to stop them from using Nelson Spruce at all. I think he's going to continue to be used. Uh, Looking at the Guardians, man, they looked like garbage again in week three. Matt Matt McGloin had a chance to show everybody that he wasn't the problem following that week two debacle. Um, but he left after a few drives with a back or a rib issue, I think. Um, he threw a pick on his uh, second drive. He was sacked. Um, I think he kind of blew it. I think Luis Perez uh, is either him or Marquise Williams is probably going to take over at QB. Uh, although uh, uh, Williams didn't look all that much better than McGloin. Uh, Williams completed less than half of his passes. He was also sacked. But the offense was able to run the ball a bit with Williams. You've heard me say it numerous times. These quarterbacks that uh, pose a threat with their legs, they can really help open up the rushing lanes for their running backs. We saw um, Tim Cook average five and a half yards a carry. Darius Victor averaged five yards a carry. So um, maybe they can keep that going. Another reason why I think I'm going to go with the under is I think uh, the Guardians are going to try and run the ball. I think L.A. uh, 
may do the same, you know, after uh, this performance by Montez Carter, maybe it'll be a shortened game. Um, Perez looked pretty good too, though. Uh, he only got that, got in that on that last drive of the game, but it was the only touchdown drive for New York. So maybe we'll see, uh, one of these, um, dual quarterback situations like we're seeing in Tampa Bay. Hopefully not, but there's a chance of it. Um, Mikhail McKay, only one catch in week three. Uh, he kind of yielded to Austin Duke, who was the top, uh, wide receiver of the guardians, four catches and that only touchdown from Luis Perez. Uh, moving on to the next Saturday game here, uh, we got the Seattle Dragons at St. Louis. Um, Battlehawks are two and one. Dragons one and two. Uh, the Battlehawks are coming off of that awesome home win, their home opener against New York, and Seattle coming off of a loss against Dallas. Seattle is getting twelve points in this game. Um, I think that's the largest spread so far in the XFL. Um, the over-under right now is set at 38 and a half. Uh, looking at the Dragons first, Austin Pearl had a nice bounce back game in week three. Um, he had, what did he have? Six catches on seven targets for 81 yards. Um, and he scored a touchdown. Um, it was a 21 yard touchdown pass over the middle of the field by Brandon Silvers. Uh, he is now fifth in the league in receiving yards, despite his week two where he had negative one yard. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, to be in the top five, and you pretty much only played two games. Uh, Keenan Reynolds with another point-after-attempt target, uh, his fourth or fifth so far this season, I think. Uh, they really seem to like him down there by the goal line with his hands and his route running, his big body. Uh, he's definitely uh, a consistent red zone target down there. Kenneth Farrell has looked like the best uh, catching the ball, at least, for the Dragons out of their three running backs. He caught all seven of his targets so far this year. Uh, unlike Jaquan Gardner, who finally saw a target in week three, he actually had three targets, and he could not haul in any one of the three. Um, I was dead wrong. I thought he was going to be a, a big PPR guy in this league, but uh, it just hasn't really worked out for him so far. Uh, Brandon Silvers played a hell of a lot better in week three than he did in week two, but it just wasn't enough to take down Dallas. They're just such an efficient offense. Um, despite Seattle turning over uh, Dallas three times, Seattle had two interceptions and a fumble recovery. Um, Seattle was only able to muster 12 points. Uh, Kenneth Farrell scored their other touchdown on a deep pass. Um, another thing kind of gives him a little more value. He's kind of targeted on those. His targets are a little uh, have a, a bigger depth of target than the other guys do. Um and then a defensive end for Seattle. Holy crap, Marcel Frazier. Uh, he had the trifecta in week three, the sack strip recovery. Uh, in week two, he also had that interception in the end zone in the fourth quarter that kind of iced that game away. So, um, you know, give some give some love to these defensive players. They're playing great too. Um, looking at the Battlehawks. So this team is playing really well. Um, they had uh, They lead the league in rushing yards still and attempts. Um, meanwhile, their quarterback is second in the league in passing yards. So they're doing it on the ground and in the air. Uh, they are definitely one of the more balanced offenses. Um, Tiamu didn't really have to do much, uh, much of all really against New York last week with his, uh, running backs, giving him 140 yards, uh, each running back scored that being Matt Jones and Christine Michael. Like I said, this team is super balanced. Um, which happens, you know, when you're that successful at running the ball. Uh, we saw them try that uh, lateral on the kick, willing to, you know, take risks. You can do those kind of things when you have a great defense and when you have uh, an offense that can move the ball running. Um, and keeps them in every single game, you know. Uh, DeMornay Pearsonel uh, looks awesome. Uh, but the matchup I like the most for Battlehawks this week is actually Marcus Lucas. So, Marcus Lucas, tight end for the team. Uh, he leads the team, or he led the team last week in targets, I'm sorry, with five. Uh, he now has 12 in three games, uh, two games with at least five targets. So he's used a lot. He's on the field a lot. Um, and looking at this matchup, Seattle has allowed the most receptions and the most receiving yards to tight ends. Um, we heard offensive coordinator for 
St. Louis, Chuck Long said last week um, that they wanted to try and get the passing game going a little bit more. You know, they'd been so successful running the ball. Uh, coming out in the second half, they wanted to try and get the passing game going. So maybe uh, they do that this week with uh, with this big bodied tight end against Seattle that hasn't shown the ability to stop tight ends yet. So I'm liking uh, I'm liking Marcus Lucas this week. Oh yeah. All right, the next game, uh, this is the Sunday 4 o'clock game. Um, game I'm most excited about this week. The 3-0 and Houston Roughnecks go to the 2-1 and Dallas Renegades. Both teams coming off of a win. Um, the Roughnecks are actually favored in this game, minus one. And uh, the over-under right now is set at 50. Um, so real quick, just to humble brag a little bit, I said last week to avoid Nick Holly in uh, in your fantasy, and he only gave us 4.8 uh, PPR fantasy points. Um, Tampa Bay had been really good at, at stopping uh, running backs from uh, catching the ball and, and from uh, putting up uh, receiving numbers. And uh, still to this, uh, you know, after week three, they've only allowed 12 receiving yards to running backs. And all 12 of them were last week to Nick Holly and James Butler. Um, but really, the star on this team is still P.J. Walker and Cam Phillips. Cam, uh, back-to-back games with three touchdowns. Phillips now has seven touchdowns on the season in three games. That puts him on pace for, I think it's like 28 touchdowns or something ridiculous, which obviously isn't going to happen, but anything's possible in this league. Um, James Butler, quick little stat that I got from the XFL.com. He forced nine missed tackles last week, even though he only had seven carries. And he averaged over 10 yards per carry. Uh, he's been awesome this year. Uh, I said it last week. I'm going to say it again. He's probably the most underrated running back in this league. Uh, he is taking advantage of this offense that he plays in, this wide open run and shoot that's just giving him plenty of opportunities, uh, seeing very light boxes for sure. Um, PJ Walker, uh, again, continues to light it up first quarter. He escaped the pocket. He drew the safety up. Uh, then he just kind of threw a floater over his head and Cam Phillips took it for an 84 yard touchdown. Um, they went for a three point attempt after that and Walker, uh, dropped back and he threw an absolute dart to the back line of the end zone to Sam Mobley. Um, nine points right there on that quick little, uh, little possession, uh, in the second quarter, uh, PJ Walker, he scoops up a bad snap and runs it in from 20 yards out for a touchdown. That was ridiculous. Um, they went for a three point attempt. Seems like that's going to be something they, uh, they might, you know, be doing at least in the beginning of games, uh, try and get off to a hot start. It was an incomplete pass to Nick Holly. The defense was offside. So they got to retry the two point attempt from the five yard line. And uh, it was an incomplete pass to Cam Phillips on a back shoulder fade. Uh, so uh, I think this three-point attempt is going to be something that they stick with. Uh, and then again, third quarter, Walker to Cam Phillips on his second touchdown, 24-yard uh, touchdown. Uh, James Butler got the two-point attempt rush in. Uh, it was good for two points. Uh, fourth quarter, P.J. Walker hit Cam Phillips again for a 17-yard touchdown. And this time... Um, it was a two point attempt. It was a complete pass actually to Nick Holly. So, um, looking at the, the other receivers on this team now, uh, while Sammy Coates targets have dropped each week from nine targets in week one, four targets in week two, and, uh, just three targets in week three, Khalil Lewis has now seen his targets go up from six in week one, seven in week two to now nine targets in week three. Um, Lewis should be uh, a great value play this week in DFS. Um, head coach for the Dallas Renegades, Bob Stoops, is uh, he's an old defensive guy. I think he's really going to do whatever they got to do to to at least attempt to stop Cam Phillips. Um, in week one, we saw Austin Prohl have a huge game for Seattle. And then in the following week versus this Dallas Renegades team, Prohl had negative one yards on one catch. So, uh, Bob Stoops know, knows how to game plan against uh, against wide receivers for sure. Um, so I like Khalil Lewis this week. I think he's uh, somebody that you can get for cheap on either FanDuel or DraftKings, and I think uh, I think he may be in line to have a, a sleeper week with uh, with Cam Phillips just getting so much attention. Um, these two teams have allowed the fewest receptions to running backs, 
and they are the number one and number two teams in targets to running backs. So they both love to throw the ball to their running backs, and they're both really good at defending pass-catching running backs. So something's got to give in this game. We'll see which team uh, continues uh, to be good at one thing, and, and or uh, I guess both good at both things. Um, and then another thing, these two teams are also one and two in the league in catches allowed to wide receivers. So they allow the wide receivers to catch a lot of passes. I don't think it really matters all that much for Dallas, but it definitely does matter for Houston. Uh, you know, Dallas with their wide receivers seeing the lowest target share in the league. Uh, Houston being, being among one of the uh, top teams as far as targeting their wide receivers. Um, so uh, Dallas, 58% on third down uh, in week three. That was the best in week three. I think it was the best all season actually so far. Uh, we saw the first double pass by the same guy. Uh, Landry Jones threw a pass and it was it was batted down right back to him and he kind of took a couple steps and realized, oh, I can, I can throw this ball again. So uh, completed a pass to Lance Dunbar for I think 10 or 12 yards. It was a nice play. Um, we also saw Dallas run a split backfield. Uh, uh, they had both Dunbar and Cam Artis Payne on the field at the same time. Uh, they had a nice little 31-yard run on that formation with Dunbar dropping a absolutely perfect block, springing uh, Cameron Artis Payne free for that 31-yard rush. Um, Dallas also, they love this direct snap to Cameron Artis Payne. They ran it a couple times in week two on uh, point after attempts and then again in week three they ran it on third and goal uh early in the fourth quarter so that's definitely something to keep an eye on too uh you know with that team loving to uh, throw the ball so much kind of funny that you know when they get down to the goal line it seems like their uh their number one goal line play is a direct snap to cam artist pain so uh definitely encouraging if you're a cam artist pain owner um so Houston um, has allowed the most passing yards so far this season. So Landry Jones uh, shouldn't have a problem racking up passing yards, but Houston also has five interceptions through three games. So uh, kind of give and take. They're going to have uh, – uh, geez, Landry Jones is going to have to be careful. Um, he's still not playing at his best. Uh, another two interceptions last week. He's got four interceptions in the last two weeks. For Landry Jones, he also missed a couple throws. He threw behind Donald Parham on the first two-point conversion, and he threw behind Jeff Baddett on the second two-point conversion. Um, so he still has plenty of room to to improve for sure. Um, Dallas, 18 of their first 20 plays were pass plays. Uh, I really don't think it's going to change all that much. I think they're uh, running that old system where uh, you know they're they're quick little dump off passes kind of take the place of of running plays. Dunbar and Cameron Otter Spain, um, they love throwing the ball to those guys. They get so many targets, uh, and I think that's going to continue. I don't. I really don't think that's going to change. Um, Houston has allowed the fewest receptions to tight ends so far, but I really don't think that's going to continue going at, after this game. I think Donald Parham's still going to do his thing. He's going to get his targets, uh, and he's going to play great. Like He has two touchdowns last week, 101 yards on only five catches. Um, Houston has been absolutely killed by wide receivers, though, this week so, or this year. Week 1, 11 catches on 15 targets for 100 yards by Nelson Spruce. In week 2, they gave up uh, 9 catches on 11 targets for 50 yards and a touchdown to DeMornay pearson L. And then last week, in week 3, 8 catches on 13 targets for 104 yards to Jalen Tulliver. So, uh, you know, maybe if... Um, if Houston is able to stop Donald Parham, uh, I think Dallas will be able to to utilize uh, Flynn Nagel, one of the better uh, uh, slot receivers in this league. Um, so maybe he's in line to have a good game. Um, looking at his stats from last week, he caught five of his six targets for 40 yards and a touchdown. Um Again, I'm really excited about this game. I think it could be a complete shootout. I'm not sure if I'm going to go with the over, though gonna have to stay tuned in for the uh three team parlay at the end of the end of the episode for that all right in the final game here of week four we got the two and one dc defenders visiting the zero and three tampa bay vipers dc gets an easy schedule to start off the first two games are at home and then they get the zero and two wildcats and now the zero and three vipers um dc's minus one and the over under right now is 43 and a half 
Um, DC's offense could not do anything in week three. Their top three wide receivers, the trio of uh, DeAndre Tompkins, Rashad Ross, and Eli Rogers, um, had a total of 50 yards on 15 targets. That is not very good. Uh, it's like three and a half yards per target. It's not going to get it done. Uh, that was our first look at the DC offense on the road. Uh, and now they go on the road again this week down to Tampa Bay. Uh, and they'll definitely have to play better because this is pretty much, uh, this is the end for Tampa Bay. If they can't win this game, uh, they're looking at a uh, long rest of season. Uh, Tampa Bay has allowed the fewest passing yards so far, uh, They've been particularly good at defending running backs in the passing game. Um, you look at the D.C. running backs, they have the second highest target share of all XFL running back groups. Uh, so I'm expecting a few of those targets to kind of get away from the running backs and go to Kari Lee, most likely. Big tight end for them that led the team in, uh, in uh, receiving yards last week. Um, DC did not help themselves in any way. Uh, they were two for 13 on third down. They allowed three sacks, five tackles for a loss. Um, Cardell Jones was intercepted four times. Um, they even had a punt blocked, quote unquote blocked in which, uh, Hunter Niswander, uh, if that's right, uh, didn't even have time to drop the ball to his foot. Uh, the ball, uh, in fact, the play actually went down as a uh, rush for negative 12 yards. He didn't even have time to, to drop the ball to punt it. Um, that defender got right up in their face. Um, not not a very good game for the D.C. defenders. Hopefully they can kind of put that one past them. Um, I think uh, I think Pep Hamilton's going to have them ready to go for this game. Um, kind of surprising, Nick Brossette, uh hadn't had a carry in weeks one and two, and then he led D.C. in rushing yards in week three. Now, granted, a good amount of it was in garbage time, but that's now three different running backs have led this team in rushing yards uh, each each different week. So hopefully we don't see another committee forming here. I think Pumphrey is the best uh, um, of the three running backs. Looking at the Vipers here, uh, this team is definitely one of the more conf- – Fused team in the XFL. The QB situation on the offense uh, is just unable to find rhythm. They don't really have an identity. Looking at the quarterback drive chart, first drive, uh, Cornelius led him to a field goal. Second drive, Cornelius led him to a punt. And the third drive, uh, Flowers led him to a punt on that drive. Um, uh, Flowers picked up the first down with his legs on a third and eight. Um, they were playing really good. They were playing with tempo. They were playing fast. They converted another third and one. They were moving the ball, and then uh, they get hit with a false start. The next play is a, a bubble screen that gets blown up, and boom, what do you know? It's third and 15, and uh, they also shot themselves in the foot. Uh, Tampa Bay, 99 penalty yards, the most in week three. Um, looking back at this quarterback drive chart, the fourth drive was the touchdown drive, their first offensive touchdown on the year for the uh, Vipers. It was, of course, um, Quentin Flowers rushing it in for for the touchdown. Kind of funny that their first offensive touchdown is scored by their uh, their third string QB. Um, but I mean, their uh, the team is just it's just confused, man. Different wide receiver has led the team in targets each week so far. Um, it looks like their big time tight end Nick Truesdale is not going to play again in this week. So. It could be another long week for the Vipers. So um, real quick, let's get into my uh, XFL three-legged parlay of the week here. Uh, L.A. Wildcats at the New York Guardians. Like I said, I think I'm going to go with the under 40. Uh, L.A.'s defense has played really well the last week. Um, uh, They held D.C. defenders to just one field goal and one touchdown, which didn't come until eight minutes left into the fourth quarter. Uh, the defense looks like they've responded to this head coach uh, who took over offense or defensive play calling. L.A. has allowed the second most rushing and passing yards so far, but they've also has they also have nine turnovers. Uh, the next closest team has six, uh, so they're definitely a bend but don't break, force some turnovers type of defense. Uh, they say good defense travels, so we'll see how this defense looks going from west coast to east to play in the early Saturday game. Uh, New York's defense really isn't all that bad either. Surprisingly, they've given up the fewest touchdowns in the league so far, um, and they're at home. So uh, we've seen home underdogs win uh, each week so far this this year, and uh, 
so I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping playing at home will help this uh, this um, New York defense keep it under 40. Uh, next, I'm going to take uh, Dragons at Battlehawks under 38 and a half. Um, St. Louis has a legit home field advantage in that dome with the defense and the rushing attack. They have allowed the fewest points so far in the league. Uh, I think they stifled this Seattle offense that really hasn't looked all that great so far after three weeks, uh, just like they did to New York last week. And uh, Seattle, they had every opportunity to score, and they just didn't. So I I think this is going to be another um, beatdown by the Battle Hawks. And lastly, I'm going to go with the Defenders minus one. Last week was an embarrassment for them. They went to L.A., um, and they gave the Wildcats the first win of the season. I think uh, this week they face the own three Vipers, who are looking for their first win. I don't think defense. I don't think the uh, the defenders will fall to two winless teams back to back weeks. So I'm going to go with the under at the uh, Wildcats Guardians game. I'm going under Dragons Battlehawks, and I'm going minus one for the defenders. And real quick, my uh, FanDuel DFS lineup of the week. I got Landry Jones for 18 bucks. Houston has allowed the most passing yards so far. I think this game is going to be a shootout. Um, should be the first real shootout of this league. I think Jones has still got his best football ahead of him. Uh, led the league in completion percentage last week. I was going to go Cameron Artis Payne because he leads all running backs and in, in uh, all purpose yards, but I'm going to go with uh, Lance Dunbar. I'm going to save the two bucks there. Uh, Lance is sixteen dollars to Cameron Artis Payne's eighteen, um, averaging four point eight yards per carry on his six or seven carries a game. Um, but he's tied with Cam Phillips and Nelson Spruce with 20 catches so far in this league. That's a lot for a running back. So I'm going to go with uh, with Lance Dunbar as my running back. Um, I'm going to go with Donald Parham for $19. He's the most expensive player, but third in the league in receiving yards and targets. Uh, he's a freak, big and fast, very big and fast. Um, my first wide receiver... Uh, is going to be uh, Khalil Lewis. Like I said, uh, I think his his targets are going to go up in this game where uh, we'll most likely see Cam Phillips get shut down by Bob Stoops. He's only 16 bucks right now. And then as far as my flex options go, uh, Jalen Tulliver. I think we see Dan Williams get shut down by Elijah Campbell, who's uh, emerging as one of the best shutdown corners in this league. Uh, so I think Tolliver could be in line for another big target get target game. He had 13 last week. Um, looking at Tim Cook, like I said, he's only $13 on FanDuel. He's averaging 4.3 yards per carry. L.A. has allowed the second most rushing yards, and I think New York is going to have to run the ball if they're going to want to have any chance to win this game. Um, and then my last flex, uh, New York allows the most rushing yards. And after what we saw from Montez Carter, Last week, in place of Elijah Hood, he had 30 and a half uh, PPR fantasy points. Um, I think uh, that offense, that uh, that coaching staff is going to have no option but to give him some touches. So that's my uh, week four FanDuel lineup, and that is the week four XFL preview on the Kicking or Sticking Fantasy Football Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, make sure you check us out next week, and as always, may the fantasy gods be cruel to your opponents. You have been listening to the Kickin' or Stickin' Fantasy Football Podcast. For more great episodes and information, follow us on social media and tune in every week. Kickin' or Stickin' is available on Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Alexa, Reach.tv, or your favorite podcast service. Kickin' or Stickin' is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. To find out more about this and other great shows on our network, visit us online at hcuniversalnetwork.com today. Fantasy football is fun, but gambling addiction destroys lives. If you or someone you love suffers from gambling addiction, please do not be afraid to seek help. The National Council on Problem Gambling operates the National Problem Gambling Helpline Network. Contact them today at one 800 522-4700. Thank you for tuning in to the Kickin' or Stickin' Fantasy Football Podcast. Please remember to play responsibly and always look for your man downfield. <laughs>